Well, I'm really excited about today's guest. Uh, today we have the Oracle of Remote Work, Darren Murph. How are you doing today, Darren? I love that. I'm doing well. Thanks for that amazing introduction. Happy to be here, y'all. Yeah, I saw that on your LinkedIn and I, I couldn't pass up the chance to introduce you that way. So thanks for being a good sport. Uh, you ready to jump into our conversation today? I am ready. Let's do it. Awesome. Well, we like to start with good news stories. Uh, it's just a, a way to give a little personal feel to, uh, to the conversation and good news. We're all going to, we're all going to share good news. Um, could be personal, could be work-related. Um, any, any recent good news that you would like to share with us? Good news coming up. Our kiddo will be three years old. And why that's relevant is we've been able to grow our family through an open adoption and adoption and fostering uh, is a journey that's made a lot easier by remote work, the flexibility that comes along with it. Uh, so I've become quite the advocate for adoption. And every year around his birthday, I'm reminded of how grateful I am for that privilege to have that flexibility to grow our family in an extraordinary way. So that's good news coming up for me. And I hope coming out of COVID, a lot of people who have felt called to fostering or adopting, but have felt confined by the rigidity of a commute and things like that, will find some more freedom and have more availability to do that. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations on that milestone. Daniel, it's going to be tough for us to, uh, to top that one, but what do you have for us? You and me to go? Yeah. Okay, I got you. So... <laughs> Uh, let's see, it's December 14th. We just have a couple weeks left in the year. And I was just reflecting on 2021. And personally, for me, this was a huge year. Uh, Steven and I started the Modern People Leader podcast together. I got engaged in April. I bought a house at the end of June. I started a new job in August. Um, so I think in terms of major life milestones and events, a lot of them happen in 2021. Um, so just thankful for, for such a great year and feel like, you know, personally I've had a lot of growth and, uh, yeah, that's my good news story. Wow. Also, also awesome news. I am going to go a little personal, but deeper into the personal realm than I normally go. Um, so, my, um, my partner, uh, Sarah, her sister had a, a stroke and, um, that was unexpected. Sorry, guys, I'm <laughs> getting a little emotional. Um, but she is doing well and she's expected to have a full recovery and we, um, you know, everything is pointing. She's an active. So my, my partner, sister, Sarah, her sister's name is Laura and Laura is literally, listens to every episode of the modern people leader, even though she is a music teacher. And so I, uh, I just felt like I needed to give a shout out there and just grateful, um, that she's doing well and she's recovering. So, uh, so that's my good news. Well, with that, I will also transition to, uh, the main discussion part of the, the segment, which starts with getting to know a little bit more about you, Darren. Um, you know, there's, you have a pretty impressive or pretty sick is actually what I was going to say career. You know, when you look at all the experiences that you've had, um, and so, you know, tell us your story, share a little bit about the journey that you've had. You know, I'm particularly curious. We're finding that because we asked this question of all of our guests that people are falling into one of two buckets, the ac accidental HR professional and like the intentional HR uh, career journey person. And so I'm curious to see which one you fall in, but yeah, tell us a little bit about, uh, what your journey has been like. I optimized my life early on for the lifestyle that I wanted to live and then found career opportunities that would work with that, which is quite different from how a lot of people approach their career. They're very career focused, role focused, goal focused, and then however their lifestyle shapes around that, that's what they go for. Now, I think the great resignation and COVID and all of that has given people this amazing opportunity to be very introspective on what is that relationship between work and life and which one should be prioritized, which one should take the lead. So early on, I fell in love with distributed work. 
I thought it was like life's greatest cheat code. I could knock off my bucket list decades before most people would even start thinking about theirs. And so that is really what dictated my career. I have landed at the nexus of people operations and change management and marketing communications and storytelling. And as it so happens, that's really useful. Uh, days like today or seasons like we have right now, where there's a lot of change happening, but you need great story behind it to make sure that it feels like more than a policy. So that has taken me through quite the journey through editorial. I was a managing editor at Engadget for almost eight years. I earned a Guinness World Record there in publishing, which still kind of blows my mind. And I've had the great fortune of working with some truly amazing teammates and leaders across all six continents throughout this journey from marketing comms and editorial into team building, team leadership, and now as head of remote at GitLab. Yeah, that's a really incredible story. And, you know, head of remote, that's not really a title that you see all of that often, although I think it's going to be something that we see a lot more of going forward. Um, so just curious, what, what does a head of remote do on a daily basis? Yeah, so the head of remote role is fairly new. When I joined GitLab in July of 2019, that actually wasn't the title at the time, but it evolved into that. And what's been wild is that COVID has now accelerated a trend that was already happening. And I've had the great fortune of co-writing job descriptions for other companies who are hiring dedicated remote work leaders and workplace strategists and workplace transformation leaders. The titles kind of vary and where it sits within the department of a company kind of varies, but it is amazing to see it really catch on. So at GitLab, I joined in July of 2019. So for some context here, GitLab is around 1,500 people in more than 65 countries with no company-owned offices at all. So the company was built all remote, all distributed from inception with great intentionality around that. A lot of other companies have co-located routes and they have pivoted to remote, but GitLab was built all remote to take advantage of all of the things that a lot of companies are now recognizing as great competitive strategic advantages. So when I joined, we were around 700 people. We were scaling really quickly and we realized that we needed to truly invest in operationalizing and invest in onboarding and making sure that manager training, these types of things were really solid and in place as the company grew. So I joined and worked with L&D to make sure that remote first principles and a remote work fundamentals course was taught in onboarding. I've helped with manager training and things of that nature. And I've documented rigorously, there's the Guinness World Record coming in handy, documented rigorously how we do all that we do on the remote work front. So that's over 100,000 words in the GitLab handbook dedicated to how we do remote. Now, what's fascinating about GitLab is that we're an open core company. So our entire company handbook, our operating manual is public. So most companies, you join a company and you, you are receive their handbook, but it's something that's private. Well, GitLab's is public. So when COVID hit, the rest of the world had a blueprint of how to do this and get through this. So, so that's been a, a fascinating transition. Anyone can go to the GitLab website and see the policies and procedures you guys have in place? 100%. So for example, instead of me having to read off the GitLab values and articulate that to you over this call, I can just say, Google the GitLab values and you'll find the exact same handbook page that I did as a new hire. Awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I liked how you described it when you were talking about your career story and how, you know, what you do is really at the nexus of marketing and people management and how a large part of your role is telling, you know, the story behind why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, is, is, you know, part of, you know, getting the word out on remote as your role to show that GitLab are the leaders in this area and to attract the talent that prefer working this way and want to continue working this way going forward? Absolutely. I had an interview with Digiday a few months ago and I told them change without story feels like a mandate, but change with story feels like vision. It feels like purpose. And that is so key to getting tailwinds and 
getting people on board and galvanizing a team to move in a direction, especially if it's a radically new and different direction. So part of my role is evangelizing that within GitLab because a lot of people are joining from co-located places and a lot of this remote first ways of working is still very new. But also because we're an open company, part of my role is to evangelize this externally. GitLab really pioneered this way of working at scale. It's a really phenomenal thing to do it at 1,500 plus people in more than 65 countries. And we want to make sure the world knows about it because the world needs it right now. A lot of organizations are becoming remote companies. And instead of reinventing the wheel, we're offering up how we've done it. And a lot of companies are able to implement portions of that as they create their own remote transformation. Yeah, I think that a lot of companies are going to benefit from all of this information that you're putting out for the world to find and benefit from. And just even thinking about my situation, so I'm fully remote. I'm always going to be fully remote in my role because majority of the people that I work with are on the in the Bay Area. And just today in our company stand-up, uh, it was shared with us that we are downsizing our office and maybe in the near future we could be completely eliminating having an office and one you know thing that was thrown out there was like if we can save a ton of money on renting out office office space who knows maybe we could like not not going to promise anything but maybe we're meeting up every 6 months and somewhere cool maybe we're going to hawaii maybe we're you know going to disney world but um being more intentional about getting everybody together at certain points of the year and building that connection. So um, yeah, I feel like this is so relevant to a lot of people out there right now. And what you really described there is the shifting from fear and scarcity based mindset to the mindset of opportunity. And that is one of the most heartening things in this transition is a lot of companies are finally getting to the point where they say, well, what can we do now that we can empower a fully distributed operation? What can we do now that we aren't confined to the one or two pieces of geography that we used to be beholden to? There are some fascinating things you can do. And I think what you'll find throughout the course of this conversation is that word you mentioned, intention, intentionality. Great remote teams are very intentional and great remote work forces you to be more intentional than you've ever been before. So if there is a buzzword for 2022 and beyond, I think it will probably be intentional. Yeah, I love it. And it's funny, as I was explaining that announcement that came out today, I was like, oh, there was a great story in there that everybody could get behind. Um, yeah. So anyways, on to the next question. Uh, what is what is one piece of advice that transformed your career and how, how did it transform it? I learned from a mentor that you can learn something from everyone. And that is an amazing piece of advice that I try to share with as many people as possible, especially during COVID. I think a lot of our worlds have felt like they've gotten smaller and you can often forget that your world is bigger than the bubble or the home or the Zoom window that you're currently in. You really can learn something from everyone. And if anything, COVID has given us more opportunity to connect with people from a more diverse or eclectic mix of locations. And so continually challenge yourself with that. Um, I also advise leaders to ask, what do I not know? And this helps you get in the mental framework of, well, I can learn something from everyone if I start from the position of what do I not know? That's interesting. We had Steve Cadigan on the show geez, months ago over the summer. And, you know, what, that was a key part of, you know, the future of, you know, the, the skill set of a high performing individual being the, having that learning and growth mindset, that agility mindset and, uh, and being willing to, to pursue new ways of doing things. So I love that. What, on the flip side, you know, what is the worst advice that you've received career-wise? Career worst advice? I'm going to go with life is short. So you hear this from birth pretty much. Like life is short. And I think the intention behind it is positive. But here's why I think it's the worst advice. Because I think life is actually 
beautifully long. And I think it's worth framing it that way so that you invest now in order to reap the rewards of compounding interest. So invest now in your well-being, invest now in your family, invest now in your community, invest now in your future and your retirement. Life is really long, actually. And the sooner you invest and prioritize that, I think that the longer you have to, to reap those rewards. Yeah, I uh, 100% agree. Um, I can't remember, I think one of my coworkers maybe posted about this recently. They were saying, you know, all it takes is, you know, tw- investing in yourself 20 minutes a week or 30 minutes a week. And over the course of, you know, 10, 15 years, that turns into thousands of minutes that could be potentially life-changing for you. So that really resonates with me. I'll also give a shout out to Wait But Why. There is this amazing article called The Tail End. If you search for The Tail End on Wait But Why, this is the most beautifully articulated layout of this conversation that I've ever seen, which is it really frames that let's say going to the beach, for example, is something that you enjoy. Even in the best of cases, you're probably only going to go to the beach maybe a few hundred times in your life. That's really remarkable to really make you think about the next time I go, I should really savor it and make sure that I I really appreciate what those moments are. But if you look at it as life is short, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. The right way to look at it is Life is long, so let's enjoy each of those moments now. And then we, we hope that we have a lot more opportunities for those to come. Love the positive focus there. Yeah, me too. So I, I think, tell me if I'm getting this right. When you started two and a half years ago, there were 600 employees and now you're at 1,500. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So, you know, what were some of the biggest challenges that you've encountered over the past two and a half years um, you know, as you're trying to maintain this remote first culture? I'd say two things. One is reinforcement and the other is the interesting dynamics introduced by the pandemic. So I'll start with reinforcement. As a team scales rapidly, you have to continually reinforce principles for them to actually be adhered to. I read a study that said leaders have to repeat themselves roughly seven times before it truly, truly, truly soaks in via osmosis. So you have to repeat yourself a lot and you have to continually look at your onboarding documentation and your manager training and your manager upskilling and make sure that you're repeating things, but also that your executives are reinforcing these ways of working. If rigorous documentation is a core principle of your team, it has to be exercised and visibly done at a high senior level. It can't be a grassroots bottom-up type of movement. So reinforcement as a challenge that only gets bigger at scale. And the second part is the dynamics introduced by the pandemic. So in an all remote company, as you would imagine, we have to be very intentional about getting people together and giving people opportunity to be together IRL. If you're trying to run a company without people ever seeing each other, I would advise against that. We are humans, we are relational communal beings, and it it really matters. I have, I think we all have what I call a social reservoir and COVID has done a great job at depleting all of our social reservoirs. And in the workplace, uh, all remote companies prior to COVID would frequently get their entire teams together for an annual summit, get, get together, hang out, break bread, build rapport, build culture. And also you'd have opportunities throughout the year for sub teams to meet at sales events, for example. So when all of that gets deleted for two plus years running, there's not really a great, perfect virtual substitute to that. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that even your social outings that have nothing to do with work, grabbing coffee with someone, grabbing dinner, hopping on a plane without having to also wear a mask and have limited interaction with people, all of these things were added to the mix and in many cases conflated with remote work, that definitely did not make life easy for any company, any employee, and that also applies to a remote company. Yeah, I feel like that reinforcement piece is, is so key. Um, I, yeah, I mean, in, in our everyday jobs, if you're gonna make a big 
change that is going to affect more than just you. I feel like you have to repeat yourself 15, 20, 25 times. Maybe you have it in a Google doc and then you put it into a slide deck and then you, you know, present it to each person in a one-on-one, then you present it to the team. It's like, that's what it takes to drive change. So that one really resonated with me. So I'm just curious, Darren, I, I, based on, you know, what you've already shared with us, you know, the situation at, at GitLab, like you were built to be from the beginning to be a, a remote based company. And obviously a lot's changed and, you know, it, there's, it's the situation we're in has highlighted the positives and what you can get from an innovation standpoint, if you're able to harness the, the power of a remote first culture and environment. If you were to start from scratch though, at a new company that had never tried fully remote, is there anything that you would do differently? Like what are some of the, the lessons learned that you took from, or that you've, you've heard from the GitLab experience um, that, you would, uh, that you would kind of recommend to new companies that are looking at making this shift? Invest in a documentation infrastructure and invest in digital tools that will support your unique physical attributes. So we'll break that down one after the other. It's really, really important to have someone focused on knowledge management. This would be one of the earliest hires I made at a company. This person should be responsible for codifying and adding taxonification around how the company works. Essentially, getting rid of anything that is implicit or implied ways of working and converting it to explicit, something that can be documented so that knowledge can be scaled as you hire around the world, you can easily transfer that information so that everybody is looking at a single source of truth. Companies have tried these company wikis for a long time. They've never really worked because they don't scale very well. At GitLab, we use the GitLab platform to build and update our handbook that may be a bit overkill for some companies, but if you take a look at Almanac, almanac.io, they're building a phenomenal tool specific for this. And if you're already, if you're jumping in and you already have a suite of tools that feels a bit chaotic already, I would advise looking at Catalog with a Q, Q-A-T-A-L-O-G. They're building an amazing tool to centralize that information and essentially create a central hallway, digital hallway, where work happens. You don't have a physical hallway anymore, so you need a digital hallway where everyone can at least look and find goals, objectives, and shared principles. Right. And for the, those that are a little older school, like myself, you know, what, when you started, you know, walking us through kind of that, the documentation tool, I immediately had like a PTSD reaction to all the SharePoint uh, projects that I worked on <laughs> as a consultant. And so my immediate question was going to be like, you know, there was a lot of time and energy put into those tools and not a lot that came out of it. At least that's kind of my antiquated view on those efforts. And so what is a more modern approach to that effort look like today? Um, yeah. So, and again, you don't have to go into all the details about it, but I'm just curious because I know, and we're going to get to, you know, leadership resistance here in a second. Um, but I, I know that that's like one of the things, you know, there's, a, there's, I feel like there's like just flags and people that were, had been burned in the past, these old mindsets that we really need to start bringing down so that people can start really seeing the true benefit and getting blockers out of their way. Um, so I'm just curious on the SharePoint comment. <laughs> I'll start by saying that I understand the red flags and the resistance because if you have been shown documentation in the past with no codification or no taxonomy, that actually is chaotic. It's just a written form of chaos. So it's a different form of chaos, but it's still a form of chaos. Imagine if all of the pages on the internet existed, but no one built a Google. It would be exactly the same way. And so many organizations right now are running around like an internet without a Google. So yeah. there's information everywhere and everyone is documenting in a way that makes sense to them, but there's no common language. There's no common guardrail. And worst of all, there's no way to search for what you need. So at GitLab, for example, our handbook is now over 2000 pages. Our handbook is essentially the operating manual to our company. So if 
you bought a widget, for example, you would expect an operating manual in the box. Well, our handbook is the manual in the GitLab box. But when people onboard, we are explicit to say, we don't expect you to read all 2000 pages ever. You may be here 10 years and not read all 2000 pages. Instead, what we focus on is how do you search for what you need to know? So we actually teach people to be masters of self-service. We hire for a leadership principle called managers of one. And we teach people to think first, I should look for this. And here's how I've been taught to look for this. And only if I can't find it within this codified repository, then do I ask a live human. And if it truly is a net new question, we get the answer, of course, but we document it so that anyone who has this question going forward will be able to find it. So there's a lot of prerequisites there for documentation to work. It has to be bought in from the highest level. And in fact, GitLab uses the term handbook first instead of documentation, because it makes clear that we don't want people just wildly documenting without thinking of, is this a duplicative source or is this really in the right place? We want people to work and think handbook first. If you're going to move a piece of work forward, put it in the operating manual in the place that it needs to be, and then people will be taught how to find what they need when they need it. It truly is organizational design. It is an operational behavior at the heart of it. And so is, it feels like this is much more intentional, <laughs> to, to sell your word, than, than what I may have, you know, have observed just by you know, reading some of the, the, the posts that you've made and listening to, you know, some of, some of the podcasts that you've been on. Like, I guess I am, um, this conversation is opening my mind to the level of intention and the depth at which you, of thought that has been put into this. So there has to be a real trust in this process that I will be able to find the, easily find the information I'm looking for. And I'm going to be willing to adhere to your rules because you're telling me it's handbook first and that I should seek the information. And in exchange, the promise or commitment is that you will make it easy for me to navigate the organization and get to the information I need. Is that, is that right? It is correct. We actually have a documented page. It will probably not surprise you <laughs> that outlines this model of paying it forward. And so when a new hire joins the company and they have a question and they search in the handbook and they find the answer, that is the aha moment that makes them immediately bought in so that going forward, they always want to pay it forward because what's happening here is they're finding information very expeditiously. This is hugely efficient, especially if they're on the other side of the world and their manager is 12 hours away. It may be 12 hours before this person even wakes up. So if they're able to find this information, they're a fan. That is the moment that they're a fan. and They want to be able to document their learnings in the same way to pay it forward for the next person. The real key here is that it transcends the individual and enters into the organizational realm. We are often taught to think about documentation just as a self-service model. How will I document this to benefit me, to remind me? But when you think about how will I document in a way that benefits my team, that benefits the organization, that does something beneficial beyond just this week, but I'm talking about next month or next year, when you start thinking about information in that way, it makes it a lot easier to frame how to document, what to document, and where to document. Got it. Got it. So I want to go back to a comment that you made a little earlier about needing to, for people to, needing to get out of the fear and scarcity mindset. And I, I just want to dig into that a little more because I, I, we talk to a lot of HR leaders, you know, I run an HR tech company. So this is my life. I, I'm having these conversations all the time. And it never ceases to amaze me how often there's resistance from the leaders of companies, CEOs, you know, you know, executive level employees, you know, the C-suite in shifting to a remote first or a, a going hard in the pain on remote. And I feel like there, it has something to do with the fear and scarcity mindset that you were talking about. And so, you know, do you have any, any advice on how to start breaking 
through that. And, and, you know, I, I feel like trust is a huge part of it. And there are ways that you can take baby steps before you start taking, you know, giant steps. But I'm just curious, like, what, what have you learned about the, the fear and scarcity mindset in your work? Well, humans are hardwired to fear change. So that's never going to change. You can look back at the earliest humans and anything that requires change is going to instill some sort of caution or fear. This is called a survival mechanism. So all of that is perfectly natural. The other element here is that if leaders have had experience with remote work pre-COVID, they may have had a negative experience that is now coloring what they think the future of remote work will look like when indeed it will be very different because in the past, most companies were allowing remote work, but still forcing people to work within an office first construct. Going forward, if you re-architect your ways of working to be remote first, everything changes organizationally, behaviorally, et cetera. So, and the third thing I'll mention here is that historical data does us no good right now. We can't use a map for Earth to chart a path on Mars. And that is essentially what we're up against. Everything going forward is nothing like it was. And any attempt to link the two will essentially be futile. That would be time wasted in, in my estimation. So what do we do going forward? It's this very interesting combination of taking the biggest leap of faith you've ever taken, paired with the smallest possible iterative steps once you've made the leap. You have to have this clean break of thought that what the future will be like is nothing like the past, and that's okay. Instead of looking at the future as taking something from what used to be, look at it as an opportunity to build something. COVID has given every leader a permission slip to try new things largely without justification. That is an incredible opportunity. It may be a once in a career opportunity to reinvent the way your team looks and the way your team works. Don't let it go to waste, take advantage of it. And then once you've committed to it, a lot of organizations who did this well in the pandemic, they said, look, we're moving to remote first, digital first. We don't know what that means, but we're committed to seeing it through. That gave people a peace of mind that they didn't have to worry about return to office dates being continually kicked down the road every three to six months. And it's impossible to plan and think about schools and where you want to live. There was an executive commitment from the jump that said, we're going to make this leap. But here's the thing, we have no idea what it's going to look like. So we need your help as team members to iterate with us. We're going to experiment with reducing recurring meetings by 30% every quarter and see if we're good at async. It's a two-way door. If we don't like what we see, we walk back through the door and we've, we've learned something. So it's really a two-part series. You have to commit to the future being different. And then you have to invite people that are interested and passionate about it to iteratively make these small steps in figuring out what that new future looks like for you. And what are your predictions on those that are unable to, to, to find the courage to make that leap over I time? The, I think the market will force them to. I think in the, in the years ahead, hybrid will be well tried because on paper, hybrid seems like the best of both worlds. It provides ultimate flexibility. But what's really happening is uh, my friend Paul McKinley at Vista is call, calls it shybrid, which is you're really being shy and you're using hybrid as an excuse to commit to anything right? So what's going to happen is if you allow people to work from the office or from home, but then don't change anything behaviorally or operationally, you're inviting a tier A and a tier B system where people have different access to information, different praise and promotion. It's just breeding chaos and dysfunction. You have to be intentional and create systems where people have equal access to information, even if they are in different places. This is what I mean by remote first. Your company has to be able to operate no matter where an individual sits on any given day. And if they choose to sit in an office, then they just go there and work remotely. Maybe that's their preferred place, but they don't go there and work fundamentally differently. So it really starts with auditing all of your values and all of your workflows and asking yourself, Hey, does this hold up? 
if someone is working on an airplane, if they're working in a hotel room, if they're working in their spare bedroom. A head of remote might be really useful to hire to answer those questions and to build a team around it because it's a significant amount of change. It won't happen overnight. And you're going to need a consistent drumbeat to get people to iterate with you until you've reached the other side of this journey. So, so going back to your comment that leaders have been given a permission slip to try new things, it feels like employees are being given that same permission slip. Like this is all just a huge experiment. And we're trying to figure out what works best. So I'm curious, how does GitLab encourage employees to think about how they want to design their lifestyles, especially around things that, you know, used to be less negotiable, like locale, work hours, community impact, things like that. How, how do you, uh, how do you encourage your employees to think about these things? Like what are the rules? What's negotiable? What's not? <laughs> At GitLab, we have one of our sub values. It's uh, boring solutions. So we aim for the most boring way to solve a problem. So the boring solution to this is we write down new and different ways to do things. So you'll find guides within our handbook where we look, we lay out examples of someone who went fully nomadic and they bought a camper van and they're traveling around the world. And this is what work looks like. And then we've also got examples of, hey, this person is a military spouse. And so every time their spouse has to move, they're able to port their career with them and they don't have to get a new job every time they go somewhere. Uh, we provide funding to build your own workspace. So if you have mobility challenges and you want to build a very specific space for you, ultimate productivity, we provide examples of how other people have done that. We even have sub-communities in Slack dedicated to home office, people that really love to, um, to get into these types of things. Examples go a long way. Yeah. I would say look into your company if, you're, if you want to start this movement Ask people who have done things a little bit unorthodox, a little bit different. And the more stories you can get, the more it unlocks people's imagination on how they truly can do things differently. And here's the wild thing. If we had just been catapulted into remote work without a pandemic, people would have figured this out by now. But the pandemic has limited the thought because travel restrictions have made it more difficult to think, what happens if I move 3,000 miles away? to be near my parents or to give elder care or to be near a school that is very specifically built uh, for a need that my child has. These are the questions that we should ask going forward, but COVID has made it difficult to think about those things because it's just been difficult to travel in general. So I'm really hopeful that once those walls fall down, people will start being more introspective on optimizing their life for what makes them tick, better air quality, better access to schools, better access to nature, access to their hometown or their community. And then they just bring their job along with them. Yeah, I love the idea of providing examples. I feel like that's so powerful. And that was actually gonna be my follow-up question. Like, you know, once, you know, a subset of your employees who have been doing things in an unorthodox way, figure out, hey, this does work, is there documentation? So it sounds like you have different Slack channels where people can talk about what's working for them and what's not working. Yeah. The Slack channel is a great boring solution to just get people talking about it and thinking yeah. about it. And what's interesting is if you have a company where people really start embracing that and they start spreading out across time zones, it's actually the best thing that could ever happen for your company because it serves as a forcing function to get even more serious and intentional about documentation because documentation pays even more dividends the more spread out your team is. And it becomes a huge point of leverage that you can take advantage of once you have oceans between your teammates. Yeah, speaking of uh, documentation, I read the entire handbook from, from GitLab on informal communication. And one thing that caught my eye was the community impact outings. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I thought of this during the height of COVID when I was being inundated with questions on why don't Zoom happy hours solve all of our culture problems? There's nothing wrong with Zoom happy hours. Like I've been to a few, it, it's fine, but they, they tend to not have the same impact after the first or second or, or third. So here's a great example of how you can use that same hour and create much more impact. 
So if you're a team leader and you're going to invite a thousand people to a Friday Zoom happy hour, those are already sunk cost hours. You've already committed those thousand person hours. Instead of getting everyone together in a Zoom box to wear funny hats and talk about the weather, deploy those people into the communities that they already live in. Ask them to wear company swag and ask them to take a photo. So when they're out there doing something that matters to them, Habitat for Humanity, reading in a local library, donating time to a local food bank, whatever the case may be, they're doing it as a community because everyone is rocking company swag. So if you take a selfie of yourself, like think of what you've done now as a leader. You've captured a thousand photos of people investing time in their community, doing something that's meaningful to them rocking the company swag. So now next week comes around, the company all hands, you have this huge montage of photos of everyone doing something that is meaningful to them. And lo and behold, you have infused a huge amount of culture back into the company. And all of that was built outside of the company walls. So a massive change for people leaders in 2022 and beyond is the belief that company culture will largely be built outside of the company. And it's on these leaders to create the mechanism and psychological safety to share those moments back with the organization. It's such a simple thing, but it requires that infrastructure to be built and that psychological safety for people to actually trust and believe that they can be deployed in that way. I do not think leaders are, some leaders are ready for that. The, it, that the snippet that you, of what you just said, that increasingly culture will be built outside of the company walls. I think that is a freaking frightening, you know, concept and that people are not ready for. And sorry, I'm, I'm so much so that I'm studying over, stuttering over my words here, but I, uh, that's a bold statement. And, uh, and I, I believe that to be true. And I also think that that is going to be a point of major resistance or, or just a blind spot. You know, I, I think the culture is so nebulous. We've been talking a lot about culture on this show. And the, the reality is with everything that's happened, cultures have been impacted some more than others, right? And there is a large percentage of companies out there, this is personal data, not, you know, not quantitative data that I'm looking at, that I believe, you know, do not know where to begin with culture. They're like deer in headlights with like, what do we actually do here? And I think part of that is this, uh, the notion of what you're describing that, you know, increasingly culture is being you know, is being impacted or evolving outside of the, the physical walls of your company than inside. That is, that is just, thank you for sharing that because that's just an, a, kind of a mind-blowing thought. Thanks for that. And I'll give you one prerequisite there. I really believe that culture is the barometer of how well values are adhered to and reinforced. And so for companies that are leaning into building culture remotely, for me, it starts with documenting your values and rigorously, explicitly describing how they can be lived out. If you look at the GitLab values, for example, we don't stop with our six core values. Words like collaboration and iteration, transparency, you've probably heard those before, but we take it a step further. We document sub values. These are explicit explanations of how you live these out. Short toes is a great sub value. At GitLab, you can share in anyone else's domain without fear of stepping on toes because we expect everyone to collaborate with short toes. This is something that if you worked at a company where people collaborated with short toes, but it wasn't written down, you might need to be in seven working groups before you had that aha moment of, wow, people really share openly here. They aren't worried about stepping on people's toes. Number one, that's really inefficient. Number two, in a remote setting, people won't learn via osmosis. You have to write that down. So if you start by writing that down, it becomes a lot easier to deploy people into their communities to really leverage. We're talking about opportunity here. When you have people in 65 countries, think of the opportunities. You can move 65 communities in different countries forward with that same hour that you were going to commit to a Zoom happy hour, that is an incredible amount of leverage and people leaders should be relishing the opportunity to do something that would have been impossible in a brick and mortar setting. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And honestly, I'm just, I'm blown away by this entire conversation. I almost feel like what you're describing uh, for our audience members that are, that are a little older, there was a time when like, you know, the web was kicking off and there were like information architects, like here's how you are. And there's still jobs out there like this, right? But what you are describing to me, it's almost like an information architect for how you work. And, and it's almost like if I am a head of remote or a chief people officer, like the number one thing I want to hire for is this, this information architect, this how you work architect, right? This person who's going to determine how you're going to document all these things to get it in the realm of explicit, not implicit. But I could go on and on and I got to, you know, we're running out of time here. So um, one of my favorite questions, Darren, is uh, our crystal ball question. We've had some pretty awesome feedback on this from other guests. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what you share with us. So do you have any predictions on future trends or changes in the way we work? Let's say for 2010, 2022 or beyond. The future of work is definitely going to be more asynchronous and the future of team bonding will be synchronous. So we'll start to do more and more work asynchronously and more and more team bonding synchronously. I also think cities and towns were going to, are going to compete much differently for talent. In the past, a city may lobby for a company to come into town, build this massive skyscraper, and that would temporarily bolster their tax base. In the future, you look at states like Vermont and cities like Tulsa. What they're doing is building amazing places to live, great green spaces, great medical centers, great schools. And then they invite people to come and live there and bring their job from wherever. This is a much more sustainable way to build a longer lasting tax base because even as people evolve their career and change jobs, ideally, they stay put. If you build the best town, people will come and they will stay there even as their career evolves. This is a massive sea change in how it has worked in the past. I also think that repurposed commute, if you have tens of millions of people coming out of COVID that now don't have to commute, it could drive significant human improvement just by pointing that time at something that matters to the individual. I gave you the example of fostering or adopting. We as a society could eliminate the orphan crisis in a matter of months or years just by repurposing this time. So what other crises exist that I'm not so intimately aware of that could be moved in a major way forward just by giving people time back. No additional funding, no additional infrastructure. There's some incredible potential here. And lastly, the next cradle of innovation or the next Silicon Valley could truly come from anywhere. A place with electricity and broadband, they don't even need paved roads, will now have access to massive amounts of venture capital, massive amounts of knowledge, massive amounts of talent that is amazing. So access to opportunity, access to information, it's now really down to electricity and broadband. And I think that countries are going to prioritize those more as essential utilities. Now that COVID has shown, it is so vital to economic opportunity and educational access. Yeah, I love that last one. Uh, I feel like the next Silicon Valley is going to come from online communities. It's not going to come from specific cities. I just think about some of the groups that I'm in and it's people from all over the world. And uh, I don't know, so much innovation happens in these these group conversations that we have that I don't think could happen in any one city. Well, I don't Maybe wanna, it could, but I don't know. I didn't want to take the conversation to a realm of things I don't understand that well, but I was going to say it could possibly even be a metaverse, right? I know yeah. Bill Gates recently, I think my, my girlfriend was sharing with me that he's quoted by saying, quoted to say that like the future of work is going to be metaverse and that everything is going that direction. So again, I don't know much about it, but I, that also popped in my head as Darren was talking. Yeah. More and more physical locations will supplement and complement the actual genesis, the origin of the information, which will be in a digital space. And that is a wild thing to wrap your head around. Yeah, sure is. I'm yeah. not ready. Okay. So on to the last portion of our uh, chat, which is rapid fire questions. So we just have a few questions for you that we ask every guest and then, uh, yeah, we'll get you on out of here. So as the head of remote for GitLab, are there three to four metrics 
that are specific to your role that you're looking at on an ongoing basis? We look at onboarding completion for remote work foundations. We want to make sure that everyone that joins the company really gets a grasp of what it's like to work specifically at GitLab. Second is traffic and impressions to GitLab's public content. It serves as an awareness and brand building mechanism for us. We want to make sure as many people as possible have access to that information. We also look at manager training completions and how frequently people are joining these cohorts. And lastly, I would say survey data on being equipped with the right tools and training to work well remotely. We constantly ask our people, do they have what they need? Can we do anything better to support them? I almost thought that this was a marketing conversation when I when I saw it, when I heard traffic and impressions, <laughs> um, but that probably goes back to your roots and not HR. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. My next question uh, is, is there anyone in the HR or not HR realm that has been on your radar or has been tremendously helpful in the work that you're doing that you feel we should have on the show? Tracy Hawkins. Tracy is the VP of Work Transformation at Twitter. I've known Tracy for a long time now. Pre-pandemic, we were talking about these things. If you remember, Twitter was actually leaning really heavily into distributed work even before COVID forced most other organizations into it. Okay. Tracy has an amazing background in real estate and workplace strategy and her ability to fuse using real estate as innovation centers with creating this new place for people to work called Work From Anywhere is really amazing. She sits at a very interesting point. And of course, Twitter is the world's megaphone. It's the world's communication platform. So how fitting that their work style is going to mirror the communication that they're enabling. So Tracy is, a, is an awesome person. Highly recommend her as a guest. Yeah, we will definitely reach out. So the last thing that we do on the show is a one word close or phrase. So anything that captures your sentiment coming out of this conversation. And uh, I guess just to make it easier, I'll go first. Um, That's code for he's going to take the easy one, Darren, but exactly. we'll let it ride. Everyone has a permission slip to try new things. Like it. I like it. You going to go next? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go next. I was just trying to, to, to wrap my, my head around the words, breaking down the fear and scarcity mindset is mine. We got to quit being so fearful about this. Good stuff. Uh, I'll close with a question I like to ask my team as often as I can remember it, especially going into the weekend, which is, have you looked at your purpose portfolio lately? And the construct here is people will frequently look at their stock portfolio or their bank portfolio and make sure that their asset allocation is exactly dialed in. But how often do we as humans look at our purpose portfolio? So if we're leaning way too hard into work and we're omitting other things that give us purpose, like time with family, time in our community, if that asset allocation gets out of whack, the long-term ramifications of that are pretty negative. So I like to try to take at least a weekly, if not monthly look at the purpose portfolio, make sure that the time you're spending are on the right things and you're giving enough time to all of the things that give you purpose. It's way too easy to say, I get all of my purpose from my work or I get all of my purpose from my family. But the truth is humans are very dynamic creatures and we have a multitude of things that combine to give us our purpose. So make sure you take a look at your portfolio of purpose and make sure that the time is being allocated correctly. I love that. I love that. Well, Darren, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. This has been, this has truly been an awesome conversation. So we are grateful that, uh, that you agreed to join us. So thanks. Happy to do it, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Godspeed. Thank you. Talk to you Bye. later.